Welcome to the Michigan Unemployment Insurance Taxes webinar. We'll be talking about the situation with unemployment payroll taxes for Michigan employers and what we're doing to try to solve some problems that are occurring because we owe the federal government. And the problem is that when we do not have enough money in our unemployment insurance trust fund, we automatically trigger loans from the federal government in order to continue making benefit payments. At the high water mark, Michigan was in debt to the federal government insurance system, unemployment insurance system, for $3.9 billion. On a per capita basis, Michigan leads the nation in indebtedness to the federal government for borrowing to pay jobless claims. There are some states that have borrowed more money in total, but if you divide the amount of money that we owe by our population in order to bring that into scale, uh, we are the number one debtor to the federal government for unemployment insurance trust fund loans. Now that situation has improved recently and the amount of money has been reduced to about 3.1 billion dollars because collections ha have increased in unemployment payments have slacked off some. But we still have a big problem and employers are still going to be assessed penalty and solvency taxes as a result. In fact, without uh, any action on our part, uh, the increased taxes per employee per year could go up by as much as $250 to $400 over time. And this is in addition to your regular state unemployment insurance tax payments based on your experience rate. This is strictly federal unemployment taxes we're talking about. And we'll take a look at some of those numbers uh, in just a moment. Here's a chart of the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund for Michigan. And the green dotted line shows the trust fund balance over the years. The zero mark is uh, when the trust fund is exactly even. M amounts above that are a surplus in the trust fund. Amounts below that are a deficit. Roughly in 2002, the wage base for Michigan employers was lowered from $9,500 to $9,000 and the weekly benefit amount for claimants was increased. We began to start borrowing money from the federal government uh, roughly in late 2007 as you can see from the chart and you can also see that historically uh, this is the most in debt uh, Michigan has ever been for our unemployment system. There's two major results of our continued debt to the federal government for Michigan employers and their unemployment insurance payroll taxes. The first is that we get a credit against our federal tax for having a state unemployment insurance program that is in compliance. I'll show you some more of those numbers in a moment. But that credit that we get is being reduced as a consequence of our continued debt to the federal government and that of course will increase payroll taxes. Another situation is for negative balance employers, and negative balance employers are those that obviously have a negative balance in their unemployment insurance account with the state. Positive balance employers uh, have a positive balance, but there's an additional solvency tax that's applied against negative balance employers as well. If we don't repay the federal loans, and we haven't, an escalating surcharge, as I mentioned, on the federal tax credit occurs. Now, the federal unemployment tax is normally 0.8% of the federal wage base, which is $7,000. The state wage base is 9000 but the federal wage base is 7000 So 0.8% times $7,000, dollar wise that's $56 per employee per year. Now this amount was reduced to 0.6% in June, so that works out to $42, but it is unlikely that that's going to continue as more states become indebted to the federal government and more loans are taken out. Now if you want to see the math on that, the full federal tax charge is 6.2% of $7,000 federal wage base, but we get a 5.4% credit for having a compliant state program. If you subtract those two, that's where you get the 0.8% I referenced earlier. And as I indicated, uh, the FUTA tax has been reduced from 6.2% to 6%. 
again less our 5.4 percent credit is how you get the 0.6 percent of the 7,000 federal wage base number. Now the penalty or surcharge is a 0.3 percent in the first year and that it increases in multiples of 0.3 percent after that so it would be 0.3 in the first year, 0.6 in the second year, etc. Now dollar wise that equates to $21. If you take 0.3 percent times the $7,000 federal wage base you get $21 per employee per year. So on a dollar basis the first surcharge is $21, the second one is 42, the third year is 63, etc. And we'll look at those numbers in a chart format in a moment. This surcharge continues until the loans are repaid by the state uh, directly or through the surcharge itself. And you can see the math on the $21 there. So your normal federal unemployment tax is $56. For 2011 it was reduced, it'll be $42. And the penalty, as I described earlier, that increases in multiples of 21, uh, I've just shown you from year 2011 out to 2016, and you can see those amounts there. Starting with the second year after the loans have not been repaid to the federal government, there is an additional penalty charge called the 2.7 add-on. And it is optional for the feds, but they can apply that penalty. In the fifth year, there is another penalty that would replace the 2.7 add-on. It's called the BCR add-on, which stands for Base Credit Reduction. Again, this allows the federal government to increase penalties even beyond the FUTA penalties that I described to you earlier. This chart shows one way that the federal government can apply the 2.7 add-on penalty or the base credit reduction add-on if they were to phase it. However, we are now in year five of owing the federal government for loans that we have not repaid. Notice that in years one through five, they have not applied any of the extra penalty credit reduction, either the 2.7 add-on or the BCR. Although they haven't done this, the Unemployment Insurance Agency calculates that if they were to apply it retroactive because they haven't applied it yet, the amount that would be a charge to Michigan employers would be 3.3 percent of the $7,000 uh, federal taxable wage base. So if you were to total this up for a typical positive balance employer in Michigan on a per employee per year basis, you would find that you have the few penalties described previously and the potential base credit reduction add-on penalty of 3.3 percent of the 7,000 federal wage base or $231. So you would have the 63, I'm talking in year 2012 here, you'd have the $63 FUTA penalty, $231 base credit reduction penalty, and that could total as much as $294 per employee per year for a Michigan Positive Balance employer. Now employers with a negative balance, as I described earlier, also are subject to an additional solvency tax penalty. With the state taxable wage base of $9,000 per employee, this is a state penalty tax, not a federal. So we're using the state wage base of $9,000. The maximum solvency tax equates to $67.50 in uh, 2011 but it will be $71.25 per employee per year and it would continue until 2018. Now that assumes that the federal debt is repaid at that time and that the federal government allows us to spread interest payments out which they have not allowed. So if the amount were calculated based on when the interest is due and if the amount of the solvency tax penalty applied to negative balance employers were strictly assessed to negative balance employers only, that solvency tax could increase to more than $200 per employee per year. So if you were to divide the solvency tax by the number of negative balance employees, which would be those employees that are working for negative balance employers, this is how you would come up with the 
amount of money that it would take to pay back the accrued interest if it were just on negative balance employers for the solvency tax. So in the case of a negative balance employer, they would be looking at the feud of penalty. They would be looking at the solvency tax in 2012, and of course increasing as it shows, plus the base credit reduction penalty we described earlier for a potential total penalty tax of $438.50 per employee per year. If the interest cost on the federal debt or the solvency tax were assessed on all employers equally, both negative and positive, then the amount per employee would be $40, and you can see the math on how that's derived. So in that case, if, if it were decided that the penalties on the interest were spread among all employers, then you would see the feud of penalty, the solvency tax spread among all employers the base credit reduction penalty and a potential of $334 per employee per year. Let me point out that the application of the solvency tax to all em employers both positive and negative is not something that we are advocating but it is something that is being discussed. We believe that the rates that employers pay should reflect their experience just as the current state experience rating formula does. But that's a policy debate. But this is one of the potential options that are being discussed, and that's why I reviewed it with you. Let's take a look at a more practical view of how these penalty taxes would work by taking an actual employer example with an experience rate and a wage base and number of employees. This is a positive balance employer and they have an experience rate of 0.006%. Now, this is the lowest experience rate that an employer can achieve. So this is an employer that has not laid anybody off or had any benefit claims paid out of their account in five years. And as I indicated, we're assuming 10 employees. So if you look at their cost for these 10 employees for unemployment insurance, you'll see the first in the year 2011, we have $540, which is the uh, experience rate of 0 0.006 times the state wage base of $9,000 times 10 employees. That's how you get the $540. If you recall of our previous calculation of the feud of penalty in 2011, uh, that's 0.08% times the federal wage base of $7,000 times 10 employees, $560. You'll also recall we uh, mentioned what the feud of penalty would be in 2011. We've simply taken that times 10 employees and you can see that number derived there. Now looking at the year 2013, if the full base credit reduction federal penalty were added to that as well for 10 employees, you can see the amount there of $2,310. And you can see the total increase uh, from years uh, up to 2015 as a consequence of that. Now the reason we stopped at 2015 is under current assumptions, the federal loans would be repaid at that time, and of course all the penalties would drop off because we no longer owe them any money. However, that is a rather rosy scenario. It's based on a couple of assumptions. It's based on the unemployment rate not getting any worse and the amount of claimants not getting any worse. It also would bring us in the year 2016, even though we would not owe the federal uh, government any money, there would not be a substantial balance in the trust fund. It could be even, uh, or in other words, zero, or slightly above that. But there's not enough money in the trust fund so that if we came into another recession or another period of high benefit payouts, we could be right back into the soup and borrowing from the federal government, and this cycle would repeat itself. So this is a rather rosy scenario here. Now again, if you focus on the total increase for this positive balance employer, you'll see they're paying about triple what they would normally pay without these penalties. There are 15,377 employers with a 0.06% experience rate. We point that out because lots of times people say, well, that's the lowest experience rate you can get. They haven't laid anyone off in five years. 
Certainly that's not a practical example. Well, it is a practical example. There are 15,377 employers that are in this position right now. In this Let's take a look at another example. Again, we have a positive balance employer. Now here we have an experience rate of 2.7 percent or converting to decimal 0 0.027. The significance of this rate is for most employers when you start a new business and you do not have five years of experience, how do they determine what your rate is? The unemployment agency will assign you a temporary rate until you're fully experience rated. That temporary rate is 2.7 percent for most employers. Employers in construction trades have a higher beginning rate, but for most employers that rate is 2.7 percent. So this is, a, this is a typical example. Again, 10 employees. You can do the calculation. You take the uh, 2.7 rate times the $9,000 state wage base times 10 employees. This is the same FUTA calculation we described earlier. This is the same penalty calculation we described earlier. Here's the same base credit reduction penalty being applied uh, from 2013 to 2015. Again, after which time, uh, based on a rosy scenario, we'd expect the federal loans to be paid off. But you can see here that for this employer, we still have a very significant increase during a number of years over what they would be normally paying without these penalties. It's about double, a little actually a little more than double. And again, uh, with, the, with the rosy scenario described earlier, uh, federal debt would be paid off in 2016. The penalties would cease. But again, the trust fund is not very strong, and we could be right back into borrowing if we have an economic downturn. There are 26,672 employers with a 2.7% experience rate at this time. This example is a negative balance employer. This is an employer that has a negative balance in their unemployment insurance account with the state. We'll use the same rate, the same number of employees, and of course the wage base would be the same. So the calculations are the same as the previous example, un including the uh, base credit reduction penalty. The difference here, though, is now we have a solvency tax because this is a negative balance employer. This example assumes that only negative balance employers are going to pick up the tab on the solvency tax for accrued and due federal interest on outstanding loans. The estimate is if that were the case, you can see the solvency tax uh, as it begins and as it phases out. You can see the total increase to this negative balance employer, and you can see that uh, it is easily uh, double for a number of years and uh, very expensive even for some of the later years. The rosy scenario repeats. We assume that we have the federal loans paid off with all these penalties. Uh, by the year 2016. Same caveat as before. That assumes no change in our unemployment situation rate-wise uh, as far as uh, the number of people unemployed. It also assumes uh, that uh, we don't borrow any more money, which again in 2016 the trust fund would still be very low and if we have a recession it's likely we'd end up borrowing and repeating the cycle. There are 388 negative balance employers that have the beginning 2.7 percent experience rate. What we're proposing to do to solve this problem and head off the situation for employers in Michigan is this. We're proposing two changes to the status quo. The first is to stabilize the trust fund through a bonding proposal and the second is to maintain the integrity of the fund through some reforms to the way claims are paid and the way claims are processed. And we'll go into detail about those. Let's just go back to our example, though, of the positive balance employer with the very best experience rate you can obtain of 0.6% or 0 0.006 converted to a decimal. And let's take a look at what we're proposing to do to address the situation. And what we're proposing to do is to issue revenue bonds to pay the federal government off completely of the three billion plus dollars that we owe them. The minute we pay off those loans, we no longer 
are subject to the penalties that I've been describing to you. So the FUTA penalty, the base credit reduction penalty, and in the case of negative balance employers, the solvency tax would disappear. Instead, we would be replacing those costs with a more predictable and stable bonding repayment over a 10-year period. In order to accomplish this, the first thing we would do is increase the taxable wage base from $9,000 to 9500 beginning in 2012. However, this wage base would float with the balance in the trust fund, and we'll talk more about that in detail in a moment. We would proceed with bonding in early 2012. This would be a 10-year bond term. The bonds are revenue bonds, and they're repaid with an employer-paid obligation assessment, which we'll show you some numbers on that in a moment. It's important that you understand that our proposal is that the bond repayment schedule would be tied to an employer's experience rate. So an employer with good claims experience would not pay as much to repay the bond as an employer that does not have as good of an experience. This is in keeping with the experience rating integrity of the Michigan Unemployment uh, Insurance Experience Rating Formula. This brings up the subject of why the federal penalties are so draconian and are so severe for many employers. Keep in mind that the rate that you pay for state unemployment insurance taxes is experience rated. The federal tax assessment for unemployment is not. It's a flat per employee per year assessment and that's the problem. So by switching to a bonding approach to this we're able to experience rate that assessment, something we cannot do with the federal penalties. At a 3% debt service rate, the principal would be approximately $4 billion assessment over the life of the bond. It's likely that we will pay better interest rates under the bonding scenario than the interest rates that we're currently having to pay to the federal government. It's important to note, too, that we would be locking in this low interest rate for 10 years. We don't know what the interest rate will be if we just allow the federal penalty method of repaying the federal loans because it changes every year based on floating rates. Included in the amount of bonds raised would be enough money to pay off the general fund general purpose state budget because they paid out $38 million to cover unfunded federal interest to avoid even more penalties but under state law we are obligated to pay them back. That amount would be rolled into the bond. Let's talk about the floating wage base that we referenced earlier. The wage base would ra rise to 9,500 in 2012 as indicated. However, when the trust fund reaches 2.5 billion dollars net of benefit payouts for two consecutive quarters then the wage base would drop to $9,000 in the following quarter. The only exception to this is employers who are delinquent in their tax payments to the agency would not get the benefit of the drop in the wage base and they would stay at the $9,500 level. In any quarter that the trust fund falls below $2.5 billion net of benefit payouts, the wage base would again float to $9,500. Beginning in January, the experience rating period of five years currently used on the state unemployment insurance experience rating formula will begin to be phased to a three-year horizon, starting with a four-year in uh, 2012 and then going to three years in 2013. The purpose for this is that it would allow the experience rate to reflect the experience faster and it would also allow many employers to shed bad years 2008 and 2009, which would have the effect of bringing down the experience rate for most employers. Now, results will vary by employer circumstances. Let's take a look at an example of the bonding solution applied to that example that we've been using of the positive balance employer with the best rate that they could achieve. 
and if you look at these uh, columns and rows you'll see the comparison. We have the bonding cost now shown and you can juxtapose that to the base credit reduction penalty, the feud penalty which are adjacent and uh, of course there's no solvency tax for this employer because they're positive balance. This is the total cost of the bond estimated out to the year 2021 and you can compare that to the total cost of doing nothing in which case we have the federal penalties and you can see that although this employer will pay a little bit more from years 2016 out to 2021 uh, they avoid the very severe penalties that would take place in uh, 2013 in 2015 and in 2012 actually so uh, it it shows you that this is a more stable and a better approach than just doing nothing and allowing the federal government to do penalties again this is a rosy scenario that assumes that if we did the did nothing and used the federal penalties to pay off that the trust fund would be or I'm sorry the loans would be paid off by 2016 and we would not have to borrow any more money so if you focus on comparing the penalties to the bond proposal you'll see that there is a advantage to this employer of five thousand one hundred and sixty one dollars overall over the ten-year comparison period again this is a very conservative comparison because it doesn't include the value the time value of money for those very severe years where this employee is paying or this employer is paying triple what they would normally pay but on e but even with this conservative example you can see that the bonding approach is a much better result for this employer let's look at the same example with the negative balance employer and the 2.7 percent rate that we described earlier again you can see the bonding cost and you can compare that to the penalty including the solvency tax which the uh, positive balance employer did not have and here's the total bond cost for this employer in this example compared to the cost of doing nothing and having the federal penalties as the method of repayment of the federal debt and you can see in this example for this employer that this is uh, also a much better approach than using the federal penalty method of addressing the federal debt keep in mind under both of those examples that we were going to increase the wage base to 9500 so if you wanted to carry the example further to account for that additional cost uh, that would be an additional three hundred dollars over the ten-year period for that positive balance uh, employer example and one thousand three hundred and fifty over the ten-year period for the negative balance employer example even with the additional cost of the wage base increase the bonding approach is still a better outcome for most employers if you wanted to follow the the math on how we got those numbers with the wage base increase you can see it below for the positive balance employers you take the rate times the increase in the wage base from 9000 to 500 which is $500 so you take the 0 .006 rate times 500 times 10 employees is $30 you take that times 10 years over the life of the bond you get the $300 additional wage base charge and you can follow the math for the other example as well and if you take the savings uh, that was compared to the penalty approach versus the bonding subtract the additional cost over the 10 years of the wage base increase you can see it's still to their advantage to pursue the bonding scenario now let's talk about some unemployment insurance reforms that we are supporting in order to maintain the integrity of the fund before we do that it's important to point out that the business community will only support this bonding proposal if the unemployment insurance reforms outlined here are included the plan is for these bills to all be tie barred so that they have to go together we will not support a bonding solution if we do not have reforms and changes to the status quo in our unemployment insurance system the first reform has already been passed that was done earlier in the spring 
This changes the current benefit duration of 26 weeks of state unemployment benefits to 20 weeks, a savings of 300 to 400 million dollars to Michigan employers. We're going to revise suitable work requirements and thresholds. Basically what we're saying here is if an employee has been unemployed for a certain period of time, we're going to start looking at alternative employment opportunities for that employee so that it's just not the job that they had. If they can make the same or better than they were making in their previous job, they're obligated to take the job even if it's not in their line of work. Underemployment has been a frustrating issue for a lot of employers. This is a situation where you have an employee that that is working for you at the same time they're collecting unemployment benefits on your account because of another employer. In the future, non-separating employers, in other words, uh, if your that employee is working for you, that would be you, you will not be charged for these benefits. We're going to expand the seasonal employer provision in the current unemployment insurance law. This is a provision that allows seasonal employers to use a different way of calculating benefits and determining whether an employee collects benefits or not eligibility. In the past, this seasonal provision has been decided by class, by industry class. So in other words, if, if the unemployment agency decided that a certain agricultural industry qualified and you were in that class, you could take advantage of the seasonal employer provision. The problem is you have a lot of seasonal employers that aren't in any recognized class and they're unable to take advantage of this provision. In the future, it will be based on the seasonal employer nature of the actual business itself and there will not be any industry class criteria. The exception to this is construction. There will be a strengthened looking for work requirement. The agency is going to work to create an audible certification program through the online and the phone certification systems that currently exist where claimants are going to have to provide casual evidence that they're engaged in sustained work and search activities. Keep in mind that if they make claims either online or on the phone that they are and they are not, uh, that, can be, that can be a reason for their eligibility to be changed and they're not eligible for benefits any longer. Another thing is that in order to retain benefit eligibility, a claimant must be able and available to appear at an agency location or respond to the agency within 14 days if the agency notifies them that there's a substantive reason for them to question their claim uh, based on benefit eligibility. Claimants must keep the employer and the agency notified of their current contact information for return to work notices. If their phone's disconnected, if their mail's being returned because they're, they're no longer at that address and they've made no attempt to update the agency or the employer, it's going to be assumed that they're not available for work and their benefits would be turned. These reforms will seek to tighten the eligibility and disqualification standards of claimants. If a claimant files a new claim and they indicate that the reason for separation is voluntary, that will now be presumed that, that they have left without good cause and the burden of proof will be on the employee to dispute that. If an employee negligent loses a job qualification and that's the reason for their termination, that would be considered a quit, not a being laid off. An example is a truck driver loses his license because of drinking, which means that they're basically not employable by you anymore since they can't drive a truck, so you fire them because or because they can't perform their job. Uh, this would mean be a disqualification event. Employees that disappear and don't notify you as to why they're gone uh, for three consecutive days, that will be considered a quit no matter what they put on their form that they send to the unemployment agency when they attempt to qualify for benefits. Individuals that claim to have left work involuntary 
uh, on an involuntary basis for reasons other than lack of work are going to have to prove that by having some medical uh, professionals uh, provide evidence of that and they'll also have to prove that there were no other uh, work leave or other programs that the employer had that they could have taken instead of just not showing up. If an employee is disqualified because they fail a workplace drug test and they dispute that and want a second test, the second test will be on the same original sample and will not be a new sample and that shall be conclusive. In the case of a situation where an employee is terminated for theft or suspicion of theft, the case would be open for a two-year period while it's being adjudicated in the court system. If the employee is convicted of theft, any charges against the employer would be restored to their account. There are other reforms. Small businesses with 25 employees or less will be allowed to spread out their state unemployment tax payments on a quarterly basis during the calendar year instead of all of it being due in the first quarter, which is usually the case because of the $9,000 wage base being met in the first quarter. The agency is going to create an amnesty program for employers who agree to reclassify employees uh, from independent contractor status to employee status where there is a dispute. The agency is going to adopt the IRS 20-factor test for determining whether, any, whether someone is an independent contra or contractor or employee. This is the same test they use for tax purposes. Uh, the amnesty program would be in effect uh, through January of 2013. Not mentioned on this slide, however, another uh, reform that the agency is considering is to also allow an amnesty program for the payment of due taxes. This would also run uh, for a certain period of time, probably a year, and in this case, if you have money due to the unemployment agency, uh, if you will pay that amount off, they'll waive the interest and the penalties. That program is still being uh, fleshed out, but that is something that we hope to see in the reforms. Administrative garnishment of claimant bank accounts, just like they do with you. Uh, right now, the agency can seize your bank account under certain circumstances. Uh, if you are behind in your tax payments. Uh, this will allow them to do the same thing to claimants. Where the cl it's been determined that the claimant uh, cashed checks or took payments that they weren't entitled to and they don't give the money back. Also, the agency will keep an account of amounts due from claimants uh, for money they shouldn't have taken. And if they ever file a future unemployment claim, any amounts that they're determined to be eligible for, uh, these past amounts that they owe the agency would be deducted before they receive any more uh, new unemployment insurance payments. In January of 2013, all employers with more than 25 employees are going to be asked to, well, required to file quarterly wage reports electronically with the agency. Uh, by January of 2014, all employers would be required to do that. Small businesses with five or less employees can seek a financial or technological hardship exemption from the agency. Example of a technological hardship would be if they're in an area where there is no high-speed internet connection and it's not practical for them to file uh, their process, their paperwork online. Other reforms, committing fraud either by uh, on the part of a claimant or an employer would carry penalties equivalent to the current penalties within the Department of Health Services or the welfare system. This means that some, some infractions that are currently misdemeanors will be changed to felonies. The agency will be able to levy penalties for willful violations of the Act, officers and directors of controlling entities and the agency will have an increased fine schedule for employers that continue to file untimely wage reports. The agency is going to establish an employer portal or ombudsman so that employers don't have to get in line with claimants when they go to have issues with their account. They're going to be able to go to someone that actually understands the issues of how the unemployment insurance rating system works and they're able to help the employer with the status of their unemployment insurance account. So these are people that are familiar with the employer end of the system 
uh, not just the claimant end of the system. <coughs> there are some wild cards or some unknowns that are out there as we move through uh, trying to solve these problems for employers or at least make these increases less than they would otherwise be if we just let the federal penalties go as we don't pay the federal money back. So let's talk about a few of these. Because the feds haven't charged us for the 2.7 add-on and the base credit reduction yet, even though we're into them for five years of not paying the money back, there is a possibility they'll continue just to waive them. And so in that case, if you think back to those examples that we gave of the bonding approach versus the penalty approach, the math will change. And some could say, well, since they never put these additional penalties on, it would have been better if we didn't do the bonding. Well, the problem with that is, even if the feds were to do that, that doesn't make the amount of money that we owe or the accumulated interest go away. It just continues to pile up. Sooner or later, they're going to have to charge what they need to get their money back. We suspect if it's later, it's going to be uh, an even worse proposition than we're looking at right now. What if the feds hike the federal wage base from its current 7,000 to something else, which they can do? This is important because our state wage base cannot be less than the federal wage base. It can be more, but it can't be less. That's not a problem now because our state wage base is $9,000 and if we do the bonding it would increase to 9500 and that's more than the federal wage base of 7000 But if the feds decided to hike their wage base to $10,000, Michigan's wage base would automatically go to $10,000. If they hiked it to 12000 our wage base would go to 12000 So what would we do under those circumstances? Are we stuck with this bond payment and the trust fund is going to grow and have a lot of money in it at the expense of, of employers paying more? And the answer is no. If that were to occur, all that means is that the trust fund balance would accumulate faster because of the higher wage base. If that occurs and, and the uh, federal loans are paid off quicker, uh, the bond assessment could be adjusted downward to reflect that. What if the feds keep extending benefits? And it looks like they probably will. That doesn't affect your state unemployment insurance account and your experience rate. However, it does make it more likely that the feds are going to be less charitable on future, on future payments from states to repay the amounts of money owed because by extending benefits they're digging their own hole relative to the federal trust fund which by the way is also out of money and so basically uh, they're they're going to be tougher on states to get the money back in there we've talked about this a little bit with regard to the rosy rosier scenario if we just do the federal penalty method and the assumption that after the loans are paid back then we'll have zeros and we won't owe penalties you know, for some time. Uh, and the problem with that is, as we've indicated, uh, the trust fund still would not have a lot of balance in it. We could have another recession. We could end up borrowing money again. This is less likely with the bonding scenario because the trust fund balance would be higher and built up faster than if we do the penalty route. We talked about this a little bit. One of the other problems with just using the federal penalty approach to paying back the loans is that every year the feds decide what that interest rate is and we have no idea what that interest rate is going to look like in the future if we bond we lock in historically very low interest rates and those rates would stay the same for 10 years there are other risks as well uh, this would be three bills, two bills to do the bonding, one bill to do the reforms we discussed. They're, they're all multi-section bills, and what that simply means is uh, the other side or those that feel that unemployment insurance benefits are not high enough for claimants or that it should be easier for claimants to collect unemployment rather than make them more responsible could introduce amendments or try to change the bill uh, to to cause problems that would drive up employer unemployment insurance taxes. 
this is our job as we work on this to make sure that that doesn't happen and that's what we are going to do. If any of these kinds of proposals are successful in getting on the bills, it's likely that we will go from supporting this approach to opposing it. If it's just going to end up uh, making it easier for claimants to make claims, threatening the integrity of the unemployment insurance system, and turning it into another welfare program, then we will oppose the bills. Some have suggested that we have a 10-year bond horizon and it's possible we could have a change in administration during that period. How would that affect the bonds? And the answer is the, legis the legislation is structured so that, that it will run pretty much independent of whatever change in administration might take place. And of course there's always political challenges. There are some folks who will not want to vote for this because they think it's a tax hike on employers. And it is a tax hike on employers. The challenge is it's a tax hike on employers that's a better alternative than to doing nothing and letting the feds tax us with these penalties based on the uh, examples that we showed you. You can see that in dollars and cents. So we have to convince conservative folks that this is a better approach than doing nothing as well. You may have questions about this uh, proposal and about the situation with unemployment insurance taxes. Please email us and we'll answer it as best as we can. I can tell you that our timetable is to have these bills passed before the end of the year because if we don't, we'll miss the opportunity to do the bonding in the spring. The longer we wait to do the bonding, the more all these numbers will shift and change based on interest rates or based on things that the federal government or the state government might do. So thank you very much. We realize this is a very complicated issue with a lot of moving parts, but we wanted you to be aware that we're working on it and we're not going to sit idly by while your unemployment insurance taxes go up. We're looking for a better way. Thank you very much.